Hi everybody and welcome back. This is part two to the extinction and evolution notes. So in the last video we left off talking about extinction and some of the anthropogenic causes of extinction. Now we're going to look at what is evolution. So what is evolution? Good definition, a good thing to remember is that evolution is a change that's going to happen in a population or a species over time. Now, what do we mean by over time? Um, we're not going to see this happening you know, overnight. So over time generally refers to hundreds or thousands of generations. And generations is the better term to see here because different species have different generation times. Um, and an average human generation time is around 20 to 25 years. Um, if you look at bacteria, some bacteria like E. coli, when they're, uh, all of their conditions for life are being met, they can go through uh, cell division every 20 minutes or so, right? So in order for evolution to happen, it's going to happen in hundreds or thousands of generations. Uh, but that's why we can see some evolution taking place in our lifetime when we're looking at organisms like bacteria that have such a short generation time. So our understanding of the history of living things and how they've changed over time is pretty accurately drawn as a tree with each branch of the tree representing a species or depending on the size of our branching tree, what we call a phylogenetic tree. Um, each branch is going to represent a species or another group that would be separate from the other species or the other groups. So here's a phylogenetic tree or the tree of life here. Um, and I know they've got a lot of big terms here. So it's not so important that you know what each of these terms are. Uh, but you notice the, the trunk of the tree towards the bottom. This is going to represent the very first cell, which would be the common ancestor for all things, all living things on Earth. Now, from this single cell, we see different branches coming off. So this branch over here represents the bacteria that have branched off of the original cell. Um, coming off in this direction, we see archaea. And if we haven't talked about archaea, it's some bacteria-like organisms that were able to tolerate really extreme conditions and really no oxygen. Um, and as time went on, we see more and more changes taking place. This brings us to the domain Eukarya, which if we haven't talked about this, we'll be talking about soon. Um, and represents a lot of the organisms on life that we would be more familiar with. So the animals and the plants and, and the fungi and such. Okay, so this phylogenetic tree is showing how all living things are related to, in this case, the very first cell. So something I'm asked occasionally, do, does this mean that humans evolved from a monkey? And the answer to that is a big fat no. Um, but if we were to look at a different phylogenetic tree, uh, one that showed more detail in the primates, is that humans and non-human primates shared a recent common ancestor. And by recent, we mean, you know, a few million years ago. Uh, but humans did not evolve from the monkeys. And, and here we can see from this phylogenetic tree, the earliest primate ancestor went on to produce um, the gibbons, so some of the New World, quote-unquote, monkeys, um, the orangutans and the gorillas. And here we see this branch over here where humans and bonobos, which are the pygmy chimpanzees and the chimpanzees here. So something kind of interesting, oh, 10, 11 years or so ago, um, a fossil of an organism, the scientific name is Darwinius marsile or Massile, um, is known as um, one of the earliest non-human primate fossils that have been found. And what's interesting, if we look at the fossil itself, this critter that you see here has some characteristics of some 
uh, tarsiers and the lemurs that are alive today, um, which other primates like humans have. So having ears that are facing forward for collecting of sound and eyes that with overlapping fields of view that gives us good depth perception and opposable thumbs to allow us to move through the trees or pick up tools. Um, and this Darwinius uh, Massile is a really old example of what could have been one of the common ancestors for the primates. Pretty cool stuff. So, why should we support evolution? Now, if you think back to the very beginning of this class, we talked a pretty fair amount about science and the scientific method. And, you know, before you can accept something as being correct, you need to look at the evidence and make sure that the, the science is appropriate. Um, we say uh, evolution is a theory, right? What are theories? Theory is something very powerful, something that is accepted. Um, in the beginning of the semester, we talked about um, Bernoulli's theory, which explains why an airplane goes up in the air when the flight controls are moved in a particular way, like dropping the flaps. Okay. We think we understand how this works, but we're not 100% certain on it. That's why we call it a theory. But every time you fly in an airplane, uh, you depend on Bernoulli's theory, or at least our understanding of Bernoulli's theory to be correct. So a theory is an important thing. In fact, we can call it a hypothesis that's supported by a lot of evidence. So let's look at the evidence for supporting this theory of evolution which, please be aware, is another possible essay question for the next test. The question might be written in such a way as to ask you to discuss the four types of evidence discussed in class, which is coming up next, for supporting evolution. Make sure you can explain what each one of these terms means and be, give an example of how it's used to support evolution. So, First idea is fossils. So what is a fossil? Fossil is pre preserved evidence of living things. And there's lots of different types of fossils. Commonly, we find uh, examples of the remains of old bones that were mineralized over time. Uh, that's a fossil. Sometimes we can find things like insects that are trapped in uh, uh, amber, which is tree sap that has been fossilized over time. There's even things like fossilized footprints. So fossil is just evidence of, preserved evidence of living things. Um, and one of the great things about fossils, why we use fossils to support this idea of evolution, is that fossils show us how living things have changed over time. And the classic example that we use for this is horses. So looking at the fossil record of horses, we found these horse-like organisms from between 55 and 45 million years ago. Um, genus name for this is Eohippus. Later on in the fossil record, so between 40 and 30 million years ago, we find this organism that's quite a bit bigger um, called Mesohippus. Definitely we see some relationships between these two here and they have some horse-like characteristics. Uh, Hipparion, between 23 and 2 million years ago, um, is more looking more like the modern-day horses, whereas you know the earlier horses would have walked on multiple toes. Here we see in Hipparion, it's got one big toe and some reduced toes over here. And then the modern horse that we see today belonging to the genus Equus, okay, these walk on one toe, what we call a hoof. Okay, now all of these have some characteristics so that we can see um, that they are related, um, but because we can find these different fossils in the different time periods, you know, we can see how these ancestral horses have changed over time. And that's what evolution is, the change that occurs over time. Second piece of evidence is what we call comparative anatomy. And as the name implies, comparative anatomy is comparing the anatomy or looking at similar structures in different species. 
Okay, and in particular, what we're looking at are something called homologous structures. And homologous structures are structures that evolve from a common ancestor or uh, one species that had this characteristic and as divergence took place, as evolution led to new species, those other species would have either the same or um, derivations of similarities of those characteristics. And the classic example that we use for comparative anatomy is looking at the forelimbs, or we call them the arms when we're talking about humans, of animals that are vertebrate. So those animals that have a backbone. And if we find when we look at the forelimbs of these vertebrates that they've got bones in common, that's pretty strong evidence to show that they share a common ancestor. So if we look at the forelimb of a human and a dog and a bird and a whale, and we could look at uh, a bat and a cat and, and really looking at most of these vertebrates, they're going to have an arm bone, which is called the humerus. They're going to have forearm bones, which are the radius and the ulna. You have carpals, which are the wrist bones, and you have uh, the phalanges, or the metacarpals, which are the hand, and then the phalanges, which are the fingers. Now, isn't it interesting that we've got some very diverse species here? So humans are very different from dogs. Dogs are very different from birds. Birds are different from whales. Whales are different from bats, if nothing else in the size right but we still find the same bones in these very different animals the chances of each of these animals evolving the same bones independently of one another is really small so the fact that these vertebrates have homologous structures that are so similar that's pretty strong evidence that they share a common ancestor. Now that common ancestor might be hundreds of thousands or millions of years earlier. Um, but it's much easier to think that they shared a common ancestor than all of these species developed a humerus, a radius, and an ulna independently of one another, and they would look so similar in that case. It would, most likely wouldn't have happened that way. Third evidence for evolution is biochemistry. And as the name implies, this is the study of the chemicals that are used by living things. And in biochemistry, when we use this for evolution, we're looking at DNA, which we've talked a little bit about, and we look at proteins. And see, DNA is the molecule that we have inside of our cells that stores the instructions for making whole new cells and for making whole organisms. The fact that DNA is used to make proteins is pretty cool stuff. In fact, I took a class in graduate school that was all about this whole 16 week class, how DNA is used to make proteins. The fact that living things on earth use DNA almost exactly the same way to make proteins, a very complex process is pretty amazing, right? The likelihood that organisms would have evolved the exact same mechanism for doing this independently of one another isn't very likely, okay? So most likely what happened is that one organism, our, our ancestral species, our first cell, evolved this mechanism for using DNA to make proteins and that as it diverged, these other species kept this mechanism. And again, this suggests that all organisms on Earth now share a common ancestor. A good example of this is looking at how bacteria are genetically engineered to make a human protein. This scanning electron micrograph that you see right here is of E. coli. Escherichia coli is a bacteria that we commonly find in our large intestine. It's good to have E. coli there because this bacteria uses some of the food going through our gut and it makes vitamins for us like vitamin K, which we need to have our blood to clot. But in the 1960s, um, the E. coli bacteria here was used in order to make a human protein, insulin. So what was done, we call this genetic engineering now, but a gene for human insulin, a little piece of DNA, 
was actually put into the DNA of these bacteria because humans and bacteria, and by the way, you can't get two organisms on earth that are much more different than a human cell and a bacteria cell. Um, but the bacteria, because their mechanism for using DNA to make a protein is almost identical to ours, bacteria can read that piece of human DNA and they will manufacture human insulin for us, right? Now, who needs insulin? People who have type 1 diabetes. And in fact, if you have type 1 diabetes and you don't get insulin, you can die from that. Pretty important stuff. Um, now, when we first discovered that people with diabetes need insulin, we got insulin from livestock, from horses and from sheep and goats and to some degree cows. But some people were allergic to that insulin because it had some foreign proteins in there. So then they would try to get insulin from recently deceased people. They would take their pancreas and get the insulin from there. But some people were getting viruses and, and other diseases from the cadavers. And as a result, they wanted to stop using cadaveric insulin. So they genetically engineered bacteria using the gene for human insulin to make human insulin for us. And the only way that could have happened is if there is an identical or near, there's a couple of small differences, um, nearly identical process for using DNA in humans to make proteins and in bacteria to make proteins. And in fact, the very first genetically engineered insulin, which was called Humulin, here's a picture of that, um, absolutely revolutionized the lives of people with type 1 diabetes and allowed them to have much longer, healthier lives. So the fact that humans and bacteria have such a similar process for using DNA to make proteins, this is strong evidence to show that they share a common ancestor. Last piece of evidence is living evidence. So as I said before, um, if you look at species that have a very short generation time, you can see evidence of them changing in our lifetime. A good example of this is antibiotic resistant bacteria. So you may have noticed if you have a bacterial infection and you go to the doctor, um, the doctor will sometimes give antibiotics. And antibiotics are drugs that are really good at killing bacteria but they don't attack viruses because viruses are not technically alive. Um, so with the discovery of penicillin almost 100 years ago and then other antibiotics that have been developed from that and some other uh, antibiotics altogether, um, we started using these drugs and it's dramatically increased the, the life expectancy of people and it's saved millions, maybe even billions of lives. But when we use antibiotics inappropriately, Right? If you have uh, an antibiotic prescription and you take it and you don't finish it, um, what happens is you're essentially giving yourself a low dose of the antibiotic. And as a result, you kill off those bacteria that are sensitive to the antibiotic, um, but any bacteria that have resistance are essentially selected for and they're able to grow and reproduce. And if you do this enough times with enough individuals, you can actually, through... Um, natural selection, we'll talk about that soon, end up with varieties of uh, bacteria that are not, you can't use antibiotics with. And there are antibiotic resistant strains of tuberculosis. And if you've heard of MRSA, it stands for methicillin resistant um, Staphylococcus aureus, which is a type of bacteria. You know, there are species of bacteria now that either there is no antibiotic that will kill them or they're just a few types of antibiotics that are expensive and have some bad side effects. So we can see antibiotic resistance in bacteria. We can also see pesticide resistant in critters like bed bugs. So as name implies, these are bugs that will live in your bed, but they can also go on clothing and hide in other areas. And these are parasites. They will take a blood meal. And I'm not going to pull up the short little video here, but you can do this on your own. Or just do a Google search for antibiotic resistant bed bugs. 
Um, and what they'll tell you is starting in the 1940s during World War II, they used a drug call or a chemical called DDT uh, to kill off bed bugs and cockroaches and lots of other insects. What we found was that DDT also killed off species we liked, like many species of birds. So with the stopping of DDT, what we're seeing is using other pesticides to kill the bed bugs. And as we're using more and more and more of these drugs or these chemicals to kill off the bed bugs, because they're not always applied appropriately, bed bugs are developing antibiotic resistance. And if what were to happen is enough small changes, so evolution is caused by um, mutations occurring in the DNA. If you have enough of these mutations occurring over time, that can actually lead to the development of new species. And here, this picture here is actually showing pesticide on a beetle, um, but it works just the same for critters like bed bugs. So here we see a beetle, or you can call it a bed bug, um, the green beetles that you see here are sensitive to the pesticide. By random mutation here, we're going to see a species, or not the, they're all the same species, but uh, a small percentage of the population that's actually resistant to antibiotics, or uh, the pesticide. When you apply the pesticide, it kills off most of the pests here, the beetles or in the, what we're talking about, the bed bugs. A few are gonna survive, chances are the um, bed bug or the beetle that has resistance to the pesticide is going to be one of them that survives. Over time, they're going to grow and reproduce and look what happens. We're gonna see more of the red ones. We're gonna see more of the ones that have resistance to the pesticide or the antibiotic, depending on what we're talking about. Treat these with pesticides again and look what happens. We are selecting for pesticide resistance, or if we're talking about bacteria, we're selecting for antibiotic resistance. So the more we use these drugs or these chemicals, the more we're actually selecting for the trait that we don't want, the resistance to these drugs or these chemicals. Again, depending on you know the example that we're talking about here. So to summarize, ooh, look, this must be important. Please pay attention. Evolution is the change that occurs in a species over time. And there's lots of evidence to show that this occurs. So those four examples, make sure you know them, because if this is not an essay question, you can be pretty much guaranteed that there's gonna be multiple choice and fill in the blank questions on this stuff. And I don't have time. This is actually a short, it's about a 10 minute video that shows the evolution of the finches on the Galapagos Islands. It's really interesting. Uh, but I'm not going to put it in this video here. And this brings us to the idea of natural selection. So natural selection is the mechanism by which evolution occurs. So evolution is the change that occurs. Natural selection is the mechanism by which that change happens. And there's three parts to natural selection. And those three parts are, number one, more offspring are produced than can possibly survive. Natural variations occur in those populations due to random mutations. And again, a random mutation is a change to the DNA. And number three, individuals with the best variations are the ones that are most likely to survive if environmental conditions change. And if they survive, then chances are they're going to be able to produce offspring. They're going to have those same traits. Um, that's why step three of natural selection here is sometimes called survival of the fittest because those individuals that fit best in the environment, they have the adaptations that give them the biggest advantage are the ones that are most likely going to survive long enough to reproduce. Okay. Now, please note that the mutations that produce these variations are going to occur completely at random. Okay, so mutations or these changes to the DNA don't occur because of changing conditions, right? The mutations are gonna occur naturally, but if that mutation gives a particular advantage, 
then individuals with that adaptation are going to be the ones that most likely survive. And one of the classic examples we use to talk about this is the giraffe. So ancestral giraffes probably didn't have great big long necks. In fact, to the best of my knowledge, we don't know going back very far of fossilized examples of giraffes that have longer necks. They're more closely related to the camels and the horses and such. Um, but if there were uh, a population of these ancestral uh, giraffes that were feeding and some of the trees and the leaves higher up, um, the leaves survived, but the leaves that were lower had been grazed because the ancestral giraffes had been eating the leaves. Those individuals that were taller or had longer necks would be able to eat more of the food. More food would make them healthier, more able to survive against attacking uh, predators and parasites, and they would you know, have more offspring that would have this trait. Over long periods of time, again, hundreds or thousands of generations, having this advantageous uh, trait of a longer neck would give them the ability to survive and after generation after generation after generation and selecting for these longer necks we see giraffes that are alive today with these great big long necks so if we were to go back and look at the parts of natural selection so number one more offspring are produced than can survive what this says is generally uh, organisms are going to have plenty of offspring. And, and there's not always the case necessarily, but it's a good place to start. Variations within our population are going to occur because of random mutations or changes to the DNA, like some having longer necks. And then those individuals with the best variations, in this case having the longest necks to reach the leaves that are higher up, are the ones that are going to most likely survive and have offspring that also have the long necks. Knowing about these parts of natural selection is important. Uh, please be familiar with these three parts. Uh, another interesting example of uh, natural selection is this classic example called the peppered moth. So here you can see the peppered moth, and it's called peppered because, you know, it's generally white, but it's got all these little nifty black flecks on it. Um, the nifty little black flecks give it an advantage when the moth is on the tree, uh, the bark of a birch tree, like this one right here, it's really, really, really good camouflage. And we have examples of peppered moths from hundreds of years ago in Europe that were collected that definitely show this characteristic and most of them have this peppered appearance. Every once in a while a dark one, so a mutation would be found for darker color. Before the Industrial Revolution when we were burning a lot of coal um, the black, all black coloration was probably a disadvantage. And I know this isn't the greatest picture, but it, it really proves the point here nicely. So here's a bird. Bird is looking to eat a peppered moth. Hey, which moth is the bird most likely going to find? The speckled, the peppered moths that are the color of the white birch tree, which are camouflaged, or the darker ones? In this case, the birds probably found the darker colored ones first, ate them before they had a chance to reproduce. So probably the reason why we didn't find many peppered moths was because they were eaten by predators before they could reproduce. With the Industrial Revolution, when people started burning massive amounts of coal and releasing the soot into the atmosphere, what happened in Europe was much of this soot landed on the trees and actually made the trees darker. With the change of the environmental conditions, all of a sudden being darker colored was now the better camouflage and being lighter colored made it so that the birds were more likely going to eat them. So as conditions changed, the more soot on the trees. Having variation in our population, so having this all dark coloration was an advantage that allowed the melanistic, or that's the big fancy term for the dark colored ones, um, to survive. 
So how does natural selection lead to speciation or the production of a new species? Um, and again, speciation is the development of a new species. And this occurs as something is going to isolate or separate a population from another population of the same species. If you keep these populations separate from one another long enough, different mutations can accumulate in each of these different populations. And if enough different mutations occur that even if you would put these individuals and the populations back together, if they're separated long enough, they're not going to be able to interbreed. They can't mate with one another. And at that point, we would consider them to be different species. So over enough time, they lose the ability to interbreed and they would be different species at this point. So this is a neat little example. So here's our population of organisms, whatever that organism happens to be. If we put in a geographic barrier, so this could be uh, a mountain range is thrown up or a river is produced or the Grand Canyon separates our original population into two as these remain isolated, when mutations pop up in either population, they can't spread back and forth. And if enough time goes by, um, if these populations are so different from one another that they can't interbreed, well, at that point, we have new species. And kind of a neat example that we see here is with spotted owls in North America. Now, the northern spotted owl, we can see in California, Oregon, uh, Washington State, and then up into Canada. The Mexican spotted owl you find in the southwestern United States and in Mexico, they look somewhat similar. But what we believe happened was during the last ice age, these two populations were separated from one another. And they were separated for probably something like 10,000 years. And over that time, different mutations occurred in each population so that they are different enough that we would consider them to be different species today. So the mechanisms for isolating populations, we've got three of them that we're gonna talk about here. So the first of which is geographic isolation, which we've been talking about, where some geographic structure or feature is gonna separate the species. Might be a mountain separating them, could be an ocean, a desert, a glacier during an ice age. All of these can keep the population split up long enough. They're going to accumulate different mutations and be different species. So when there's the populations are separated by a geographic feature, that's called geographic isolation. Temporal isolation. Temporal means time. So temporal isolation is when different species are going to mate at different times of year. Um, and if we look at some of the species of frogs um, in our area, right? So we've got bullfrogs and wood frogs and leopard frogs. They all belong to the same genus. So they share a somewhat recent common ancestor. But because they reproduce at slightly different times of the year, the chances of a male from one species mating with a female of a different species is pretty low. So they are essentially isolated from one another because they mate at different times. My favorite isolating mechanism, though, is mechanical isolation. And mechanical isolation occurs when the reproductive parts of one species don't fit into the reproductive parts of another species. So think about what has to happen for sexual reproduction, right? You have to have sperm transfer taking place. Um, if the uh, mechanism that we have for transporting sperm from the male to the female doesn't fit into the female, yes, that's what I'm talking about, then these species are essentially isolated from one another. And a really interesting example is in snakes. So how do snakes reproduce sexually if they don't have limbs for wrapping around one another and allowing the sperm transfer to take place? Well, male snakes have these structures called hemipeni. And there's two of them. 
Um, so when a male, in this case, this is a Western diamondback rattlesnake. When a male Western diamondback rattlesnake slithers up to a female Western diamondback rattlesnake, he's got a hemipenis on either side for taking care of these sperm transferring duties. Now, if you take a look at these hemipeni, there are it's a unique arrangement to the parts here. Um, these bumps and grooves, and, and in some cases, these spines will only fit into the cloaca. The cloaca is the common hole that a female snake uses for getting rid of uh, both wastes as well as eggs for laying the eggs. So the hemipeni of a male Western diamondback rattlesnake only fits into the cloaca of another female Western diamondback rattlesnake. It won't fit into the cloaca of another species. Because those parts don't fit in different species, these uh, uh, different species are now mechanically isolated from one another. So again, what's the relationship between evolution and natural selection? Evolution is the change. Natural selec selection is the mechanism for causing that change, which again may involve isolation of different populations. Now, sometimes we can have selection that isn't natural. And in that case, we call that artificial selection. So artificial selection is when humans use selective breeding to select specific traits in valuable species. And the classic example of artificial selection would be in dogs. So let's say you have a farm and you want a dog to protect your sheep. Well, you might use uh, Bearded Collie, which is a variety of dog right here, because they're really good at herding sheep together and helping to fight off uh, predatory wolves that would be attacking their sheep. And if you have a female dog that is a really good shepherd, you will breed her with a male dog that is a particularly good shepherd, and as a result, you'll end up with puppies that are most likely going to be good shepherds. And after doing this for thousands of years, we end up with different varieties of dogs that have traits for doing different things. So some of them are shepherds. Some of them are good for hunting, like the beagle that you see here. Some of them are used for personal protection. Um, so humans have come by and selected which male is bred with which female so that they have the characteristics that we like. All right, so for test number two, some of the important essay questions that you might need to know about. List and explain the anthropogenic causes for extinction. That was CHIPO, that was from the first video. Four types of evidence for supporting evolution be able to explain what each one of those means. So what is meant by biochemistry? Don't just say biochemistry, but be able to say biochemistry refers to important chemicals like DNA and proteins, and how um, the fact that different species use DNA the same way to make proteins is strong evidence that they show a common ancestor. So make sure you do that. Also be able to define evolution and natural selection, know the difference between them. Um, I had mentioned know the parts of natural selection. That's not necessarily as an essay question, uh, but there could very easily be multiple choice and fill in the blank questions on that. So please be working on that. And that's all that I have. So thank you very much, folks. Keep up the hard work, take care of yourselves, stay healthy, and we'll see you around.